Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching another episode of the WeVA Podcast. I'm super excited about this episode. We're welcoming Erica Cardenas for the first time on the WeVA Podcast. Uh, Erica has recently been accepted to speak at Haystack US uh, 2023 about uh, WeVA's ref to vec and recommendation and all these exciting topics. So Erica, firstly, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> and we're, I'm also super, super excited to welcome Siva and Roman from MetaRank. MetaRank is a super exciting uh ranking software and the, uh, watch their haystack talk as well and there's so many exciting topics that i'm just so excited to get into i think this will be just an awesome search and recommendation uh, podcast and that kind of topic so um maybe to kick things off uh, erica could you maybe talk a bit about kind of like the weva perspective on recommendation and ref to vec and kind of like sort of like where we're coming from in this topic yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so we released Ref to Vec, um a few releases prior. Um, so what this does is it really um, works well with recommendation. Um, so what it does is it's vectorizing the user along with its interactions with products or movies. Um, so what it, why it's called Ref to Vec Centroid is because it's taking the average of the uh, interactions with the products or movies, like I said. Um, so what it does is it's creating my user digital profile, shall I say, by taking the movies that I'm interacting with. So let's say I like sci-fi and rom-com, it's gonna average those two embeddings. And then my digital profile is essentially just the average of those um, interactions that I have. Um, so yeah, this is great with recommendation. And it, it what's awesome about it is that it really works um, quickly. Um, so all it takes is a few interactions, right? For it to create this digital profile, just to make sure that the recommendation is accurate um, to the user and you're not, um, kind of recommending, recommending things that they don't like. Um, so in addition to that, the benefit of this approach is that um, it can be characterized from its actions and relationships. So the kind of, um, yeah, just like I said, the recommendations are clear and personalized to that specific user. Um, so by aggregating their cross-references, it allows WeBe to immediately learn from the user's uh, preferences and everything and how this it ties into using vector search is that you can use the near vector filter um, or yeah, um, use the near vector and uh, type in my digital profile of my embedding. And then it's going and then you can tie in symbolic filters of um, let's say I kind of want sci fi movies that are uh, were produced after 2015. So it's digitally appealing and it's not like the old stuff that no one kind of wants to see anymore. Um, so this also ties into going to generative search. Um, so let's say from my movies example, if I want it to summarize like five new movies that I'm interested in, um, it can kind of do that, right? Because it has my digital profile along with creating maybe um, like along with, um, I don't know if you guys think like with GPT-4, it will eventually create content. So how do you really filter that out and make it like user specific? Um, and this definitely ties into meta rank with all of this content and like an abundance of information that um, users will eventually have. How can we rank that and, you know, make it more user specific? I have a question regarding recommendations because every time I hear embeddings in recommendations, I'm triggered uh, to ask a question how you compute this embedding. So technically, is it like a matrix factorization, collaborative filtering or... Yeah, I think if I'm hopping on this quickly, um, yeah, I think right now we just have, um, like, we vectorize all the products or the movies with Clip, and then we, you know, the user likes these movies, you know, like these three movies, and so we just average these embeddings and send them back uh -huh. to the user. Yeah. So. I think, I, yeah, and I'd love to talk about how this extends to collaborative filtering. I think that'll be a super interesting topic, but I think um, that was a really great background, Eric, and I think that really sets the stage for kind of our interest in recommendation. I think also kind of ranking this topic is, of course, relevant to search in general, where, you know, they will get into these kind of things. But to pass the mic, uh, Roman and Siva, can you tell us about kind of like the founding story of MetaRank, generally how you're seeing the space? Yeah, maybe I can uh, I can chip in because probably later on Roman will do the main talking because he's more technical uh, than I am. Uh, we've been working closely with Roman for more than uh, seven years already, I think. Um, we've been working in an e-commerce startup before. And uh, the startup was in, was in the search and recommendation space. It was like a, it was using Elasticsearch back in the day. And, uh, you know, the, the recommendations were based on collaborative filtering, uh, like really simple algorithms, but they were working 
kind of really well, and kind of we've had quite a few customers. Uh, it was a success story of a startup. Uh, it was acquired uh, back in the day, uh, and uh, actually, what Roman did in there is working on personalization. How do you actually personalize search results and later on category and collection pages for for e-commerce stores? Uh, kind of, I was kind of managing Roman a bit. Uh, so kind of, that's how we came came up together. Uh, with the idea of having an open source uh, engine that can do personalization uh, and do personalized ranking kind of for everyone uh, that is not specific to e-commerce or ad tech or kind of any other vertical uh, that you can easily kind of just take, uh, drop some configuration, drop your events, and then kind of it runs the personalization. You don't need to know uh, a lot machine learning stuff or data science. Kinda, you don't need to set up complex uh, data pipelines kind of use serious stuff etc uh you just take the tool it works almost out of the box kind of that was kind of the idea behind metrank and uh, um yeah maybe roman can kick in now because he's been working mostly on it from the code perspective yeah so as uh we you mentioned uh, haystack so when uh learned rank was a hyped thing like for in 2023, it's not anymore like a, 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 like on a hype, but more like a commodity. But back in the days, if you hear all the talks related to ranking, they're kind of you only change the company names, but the general like okay, we did some sort of feature engineering, this type of labelings and back and forth, and then we throw everything to XGBoost and got our improvement in conversion. You, you can just uh, see that the companies are doing the same thing, but it usually takes quite some time to set up all this data processing pipeline because throwing things on XGBoost is easy. Computing the things, especially in real time, is not. So we decided to make it like a commodity, you know? So how, this, how, how it was with Lucene originally. Because to do search back in the days, you need to be, you know, like a Java specialist knowing how inverted indexes work and do this crazy things with the Lucene API, which is obscure enough. And uh, then Solar and Elasticsearch search came and then no one even knows how Lucene works. You just throw JSONs to Elastic and it works. Uh, eventually, this commoditization is happening for my own experience and my own opinion even with this vector search because like hnsv is 2016 or something so can you do vector search in 2016 why not uh but did anyone build vector search then no because you need to have you know phd in different things to glue things together and now you throw jason's to Deviate and it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I love that. Um, the you know the the whole design of Meta Rank. I, I'm pretty familiar with it. I've started looking into it. The kind of how you pass these JSON dictionaries for the user features and the item features, and maybe I mean there there's quite a few topics I want to hop into with this with because Meta Rank this whole like ML ops stack around ranking. Can we maybe touch on that topic a little bit? Yeah. So it's not about some basic features about items and users, like this item has this price. This user uh, came from an advertisement. There are usually some more stateful, complicated features. This item has a click-through rate of something over the last uh, seven days, and it quickly becomes quite complicated if you want to do backtesting and training, so you need to have some feature logging, this uh, two ways of computing features like offline, online. And if you want to do something more complicated, uh, I don't know, embeddings, uh, do some cross encoders. It also complicates things, but and uh, at the end, it's the same thing. So okay, take mini LM from sentence transformers and feed it with query and with a title and compute the similarity. So it's the same thing people are doing again and again. So we wanted to make it also a commodity. Like you throw JSONs to MetaRank and it works. Ah. I have one question on this topic. So Seven Roman, you guys really touched on 
making MetaRank user friendly and easy for people to use, right? It's like very abstract. They don't really know what's going on under the hood. It's just like as simple as just doing a JSON file. So um, how do you guys, like how do you guys prioritize the user experience in this case and what kind of approach do you take to that? Originally we took kind of the, um, we tried to build a tool that we can use ourselves. So like me as a, like I'm in, I have a development background, uh, although like I'm a manager now, but can I still can, can do some coding, uh, but I'm not versed in this all the ML stuff or data science, whatever. Um, it's kind of, I was the test guy uh, who could kind of go into my, take my rank and, and do something with it. Like we have this uh, uh, movie lens uh, data set that kind of we use in our demo and kind of we've used in several talks as well uh, that will build specifically to showcase personalized ranking. And kind of the idea is that uh, me as a regular developer uh, can take Metrank, can run some comments, can I, can I read the docs, can I follow the steps, and in, can I in the end get personalized ranking? Uh, so kind of we took originally this approach. Um, it worked quite well, uh, although originally Metrank was kind of built with uh, quite some uh, specific technologies in uh, in the back. So you in order like if you want to run it, to run it locally, uh, it's it's not hard. Kind of you just it's a Java app, you run it. But if you want to run it, uh, let's say in, in Kubernetes, uh, it became one hell of a job because uh, because of the technologies that we've used inside Metrank. So kind of we've focused on simplifying that stuff. We focused on simplifying, like completely removing uh, databases, having like in-memory storages uh, so that you can run it locally. Um, but yeah, like, like and the, uh, after that, kind of just getting feedback from the users, uh, the companies, we have some several test pilots, uh, let's call them like that. So companies from different verticals that uh, try to use Metrank, they have different use cases, uh, different uh, amounts of data even, like uh, once ha- like some companies have maybe like thousands of data points, others have millions of data points. Like how do you optimize for that? Uh, how do you make it easy for them to use in different use cases? Kinda, so, testing it on us and then uh, uh, getting feedback from early adopters. But usually early adopters came and uh, have some so obscure ways of using MetaRank. You never even thought that people will come with it. But if you start thinking and just go back one step, it's kind of reasonable. And you just uh, becoming a you get a better understanding on how it can be used. So we always focused on implicit feedback for the ranking, like users clicks on items and we optimize based on that. But in some cases you have explicit feedback. So, and for large companies, that's kind of typical, for example. So you can have analysts who will just label the search results manually for top 1000 queries. Why don't you use it? But with MetaRank, no way. And uh, so just speaking to people, that's why we have Slack uh, and people usually go there and ask some absolutely weird questions. <laughs> Can you give us an example of one of those or is it all covered? With uh, <laughs> uh, there was a guy who came there and asked, uh, what about reinforcement learning? And I was like, what about reinforcement learning? So can you do reinforcement learning? It, like, I know in theory how to do reinforcement learning for search, but I never did it actually. And this guy like, but I did, I will tell you. And started just posting there like a long reads on how to do with the different links. And no, so what do you think? And like, oh, whoa, that's <laughs> interesting experience. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I mean, maybe I think like recommendation on this topic a little bit. I, I thought a bit about how it could be a reinforcement learning problem where, you know, maybe you make a sequence of recommendation decisions to ultimately achieve something like, like I, I think about kind of like the TikTok, the like video platform where maybe if I show you video A, C, D, and E, you watch A for seven seconds. I've already forgotten what I just said, but the next one for three seconds and then for five seconds. And then something about that leads you to watch the last one for like two minutes. Uh, Maybe a better example would be like kind of the education case. Like if I'm recommending you educational resources, I like this example a lot because let's say I have like five parts to my 
chapter. And I also have a summary of the five things. If, if I'm trying to recommend you something that'll probably lead to the average case best score, I'll probably just out give you the summary. But if I give you these five in sequence, then so that kind of thing of the sequence. But to take a step back, I think um, maybe if we could sort of explain, I'm worried that we might have dived in a little too quickly for the podcast. If we could just kind of explain the difference between retrieval and ranking. I know it's a little... It's like I know everyone here already knows it, but if, if you guys could just describe how you're seeing the difference between these things. Oh, I can. I read uh, re read the Splade and Colbert papers today, so I mm. can give you like a long lecture about <laughs> <laughs> an issues of retrieval. <laughs> but uh, if you if we speak about meta rank, it is just a re ranking thing, and it's not a silver bullet because it heavily depends on the retrieval side. Uh, so for some cases, if your retrieval is very, very focused on precision, like you search for pizza and it found single pizza, whatever, maybe there are some margaritas and uh, quattro formaggi somewhere, but <laughs> it's not in this results. It's focused on a precision. We got like a perfect precision, like one document and that's relevant document. So nothing mm -hmm. wrong with the search results from the pre precision pers perspective. Can you improve it with ranking? Probably no. That's just because of uh, one document and the search results. So you need to balance between precision and recall. So allow something which might not be 100% relevant, but there will be just more relevant results overall. But where is the balance? That's a good question. So I don't know. For Elasticsearch, it's, uh, if you have a long queries, you can combine them with or so it, at the end it will allow you to have some better recall in the cost of uh, noise in the search results uh, semantic search in theory helps like solves this particular problem because for example if you're searching for pizza it's just single term like you, you can't have pizza or or what or pizza uh, so with, with semantic similarity, it mm -hmm. will match also mm -hmm. pepperoni and all that things. Can you explain more about the history of ranking with keyword features? Like exactly like the pizza and then like. Pizza. Uh, so I didn't get the question, like ranking with keywords is. Yeah, I guess my angle is like, how do you combine like with the text features, such as like with BM25, the BM25 score along with like an n-gram matching? Like, how do you rank with that? Ah, okay. So, um... yeah, uh, Roman, maybe we can also touch the point about multi-rich, multi, how do you call them? Retrieval retrievers. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. But I will start with the usually how it how people rank when they don't have any feedback. So, for example, you have ngrams, you have BM25 scores, you can have some cosine distance between embeddings and so on. These are just characteristics of your uh, items. So you can just throw it as a as a ranking factor to the lambda mart model for this. Like mm. literally, just throw things and ex to XGBoost and hope uh, that it will work. And uh, surprisingly, it usually works. So there are some approaches even to do it within Elasticsearch, like playing with boosts. So there was a talk on Haystack mm -hmm. a couple of years ago about learning to boost, and uh, there was like an almost analytical solution to the problem of how to optimize boosts, not like randomly, but you literally just compute which boosts are minimizing pairwise loss across your click-through history, which sounds very smart, but at the end, it's just logistic regression, and you got your numbers, like put this boost there and you got your nice ranking. But some, in some cases, for case like multiple retrievals, retrievers, sorry, when you have elastic search for term matching and I don't know, via V8 for uh, semantic matching, and then you can intersect these two sets of results in a single ranking. So if document comes only from term matching, then it 
got only BM25 score. If it comes from VAV8 and uh, Elasticsearch, then there are two ranking factors like your BM25 score and your cosine uh, distance. And you use it. So if you ha have only two ranking factors, you can go without all this complicated uh, Lambda Mart methods. But uh, if you mix user behavior, I don't know, like a click through per item, or maybe per click conversion rate, or maybe length of a document or length of your query, then a num number of ranking factors goes up and you can't just mix it with logistic regression that easily because it doesn't become more stable when you have more ranking factors. Yeah, and uh, kind of when it comes to MetRank, uh, from the MetRank's user perspective, uh, it's the same thing. You just have some YAML configuration for those features. So you have BM25 as a feature uh, for for the Lambda Mart model. You have uh, let's say cosine similarity as as a fe as an, another feature, maybe something else as another feature, and uh, MetRank does all the all the work for you for kind of combining those features together, combining the scores of your items. Like if you have a set of results from multiple retrievers, MetRank combines those uh, kind of the, the scores of each retriever and uh, kind of does all the smart things, puts it into the model and kind of you, you get the optimal uh, ranking in the end uh, that kind of increases your CTR or whatever. Uh, whatever else it can increase, kind of depend depending on your KPIs and your business goals. Um, kind of that's kind of where we also kind of where we try to make the life easier for the people. Kind of you only need to think how you match stuff together uh, in case of multiple retrievers, for example. But I got the impression that all this ranking optimization are kind of a complicated topic for people. So if you're attending Haystack conference, probably you know what's that. But if you're trying to explain to your grandma what is the re-ranking and or just, you know, you pitch investors like oh, we do re-ranking and they're like, you do what? Uh, <laughs> so we're considering to make it a bit more uh, human friendly. So we also do recommendations because it's also kind of a not completely similar, but uh, given the data model we have for the uh, input events, it's quite easy to implement recommendations on top. So you, you, so MetRank is just a way to have a contract about type of different events, like Segment IO does for analytics, for example. Uh, MetRank does does for ranking and recommendations. So that's an interaction, that's a metadata about item, that's metadata about user. You just throw it there and it works. And you just tune the parameters of different models. So from my experience, doing machine learning is usually like 5% of all the time you do while building ranking or recommendations. And 95% you just struggle and cry around different data pipelines. How to compute these features? It's computed incorrectly. Okay, that's a nice article released. Let's try it. Um, so, um, but it would be nice if the contract stays the same and you got all these improvements just for free. Yeah, it's uh, another kind of fun thing about recommendations is that kind of originally Metronic was only about uh, re-ranking and kind of personalized re-ranking. And uh, we did a Hacker News launch about a year ago, and people were kind of really excited. We, we were not expecting uh, to have that much response and kind of people writing us, joining Slack, etc. But everyone was asking about recommendations because whenever kind of you talk about ranking and personalization, everyone thinks about recommendations. And kind of finally, about like a Two months ago, probably we've added the ability to calculate recommendations uh, into Metrink as well, and that's also kind of based on the user feedback that we got. Because um, when it comes to recommendations, uh, there are a lot of different algorithms. There are a lot of Python libraries uh, that you can that you can take to implement those recommendation widgets in your in your store or in your web app or in your social network, 
uh, but in order to utilize them, you need to be a Python expert. You need to know, you need to have data pipelines and all, all the other things uh, to hook that up and display the recommendation widgets. Uh, with Metrank, you already have all of that built in. And thanks to, like, we've already have had that as well. That's why it was kind of easy for us to, to add those kind of recommendation generation stuff into Metrank. Yeah, so I think this topic is just super interesting. This kind of like, there's this kind of topic of like multi-vector representation of objects. Like if I have, you know, a book and I have a title, I have a abstract, let's say, and then I have like content, I would have a vector for the title, a vector for the content, a vector for the author, I don't know, like multiple vectors that represent this object. And then when I'm ranking them, I would have like, you know, the vector similarity score for the title, uh, the BM25 score for the title, maybe also these n-gram features that Erica mentioned and combining all of this with an XG boost model. My big question with this kind of approach is, do you then kind of sacrifice out of domain generalization, like by fitting it with this kind of model, do you just hyper focus on this data you have? Like, how are you thinking about the generalization of this kind of approach? Uh, so in text search, uh, if, if we just speak about text search that you have only query and a document and that's it, uh, it's hard to generalize, but usually you also have behavior. So, okay, this visitor interacted with the, so was presented with these documents and you have some sort of a bias in this training data because people click more on the first items. And then uh, this item was displayed after that item. So there is some sort of pairwise difference. Uh, so it's just practically quite useful to do. So, and it still tries to optimize uh, so so and uh, this uh, interactions uh, between the features like you described the tangrams they can be uh, non uh, non linear so it's hard to find some linear explanation for them like put them in a logistic regression and hope that it will rank properly um because, for example, BM25 score is unbounded to the top. So it can, like, 1 or 5 or 55 or 5,000. That's possible values. When you can't just easily normalize it. And you, so it quickly becomes quite complicated for normal, normalizing different ranking factors. And if you throw everything at XGBoost, it just handles it uh, automatically. Yeah, it's super interesting. And I think um, maybe staying on the XGBoost style, I'm super fascinated with the way that you've implemented the Kafka streaming and how you estimate the click-through rate within a window. Can you maybe talk about that kind of system design for how you get that feature with the streaming data? Because I think that's just a super powerful part of this. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a long story. So Seva mentioned that we did some uh, design decisions originally. Uh, so when people try to run MetaRank uh, somewhere, uh, they found that it's kind of a very complicated thing. So we used Apache Flink before that for the streaming, all the streaming, stateful streaming things. And it's nice when you're a large company with 1,000 uh, customers uh, to use this type of, of streaming framework. But uh, if you're just a small to medium edutech provider, you don't need this type of heavy artillery for data processing. You don't, you can't process it on one, two nodes. You don't need a cluster of 100 nodes. But uh, <clears throat> being able to, to scale, you sacrifice the simplicity and some flexibility. So we struggled quite a lot using Apache Flink. We tried to solve this problem of complexity with documentation. And when I wrote the deployment, Kubernetes deployment guide for MetaRank, which was like, you know, like a Bible, so huge, so long, with all this, you need to install this, then you need to have Kubernetes operator to control state of the Apache Flink jobs. Then you do a custom 
resource for the job, then you deploy something there and uh, you need to be like a professional DevOps to run it. Uh, at the end, we just removed the Apache Flink and rewrote all this data processing pipeline into something more reasonable. At the end, it's just not really Java app, it's Scala app, but whatever, GVM app. You sacrifice, we sacrifice scalability, but still it depends uh, on performance. So uh, for this click-through rates, uh, it's one of the first complicated features in MetaRank, but I remember that I, in my previous couple of companies, I spent quite some time implementing it properly uh, because you don't only need, don't only need click-through rate uh, right now for this period of time. If you do backtesting, you need to have uh, to be able to answer for question, what was click-through rate for this item half a year ago for the seven days? And you're like, um, that's you know, that's possible to compute. But uh, imagine that you have a couple of millions or maybe billions of different search results, and computing it one billion times quickly becomes unreasonable. So you do a lot of different tricks and hacks, and all these hacks are part of meta rank. So it's maybe my fifth attempt to implement this rolling window click-through rates. So technically, uh, these click-through rates are aggregated within a bucket. So like one hour or maybe one day, it doesn't really matter. So um, they are aggregated, not like the, click, the actual rate. So you count number of, uh, for example, interactions, like clicks and number of impressions in a rolling buffer of, uh, of this where bucket is like a period of time. And then uh, from time to time, eventually, depending on the your load, and not every time, like what, once in an hour, you divide one rolling buffer to another rolling buffer and get your rolling CTR. Mm. And then you aggregate mm. for the periods, like one day and so on. So we spent quite some time so originally we even had some something like a feature store implemented by ourselves on top of apache flink uh, but mm. it was quite complicated to do some stateful things on top of that and at the end we get rid of it and simplified it quite a lot but uh, as a fan of test driven development it was like a pleasure factory so you you have so many tests and you just make them all of them pass and at that moment you can release sorry guys i need to plug in my computer i'll be right <laughs> yeah no problem <laughs> sorry about that okay great i i do have a follow-on question <laughs> so let's go this Awesome. So I, I think this kind of click-through rate, this discussion of feature store is really interesting. I'm really excited to have this chat and learn from you about this because I've been thinking a lot about how do we integrate with Weaviate, with MetaRank, what would this kind of thing look like? And maybe as a quick background, so Weaviate, we have symbolic properties, but uh, I, don't, I don't know how well that interfaces with this kind of CTR online estimation thing. I listened to your talk where you talk about, um, you know, cold data, Postgres, hot data, Redis, uh, and then or does... Or does this just live in meta rank where in, you know, you, as you mentioned, like what, one thing that's so cool about this is you've done the, the Kubernetes, like it's like an API that, you know, with we I can just kind of send my data, you know, API get score back. So like, how, how would we integrate sending, you know, integrating the properties? Cause we do have metadata in we How do we integrate it with meta rank? So I think that's not the way we eat should be integrated with meta rank, but uh, the, on the customer, the integration should happen on the customer side. So you send your, it's like an analytical events you send to segment IO, like user actions. Uh, you got your inventory update and this item now is in stock or you title is changed or mm. price changed or you got a user new user registered and you know something about this user i don't know country or age it's also just bits of metadata and you throw these events into this into the api or into the kafka stream but like 
with segment uh, or Google Analytics, just some specific types of events, you notify that this happened at that moment. And MetaRank stores this huge log of all this metadata changes. And also you send events for, okay, I tried to display this search results or maybe recommendations to this visitor. And then visitor clicked on item number three. So you send mm -hmm. rankings and clicks. And then you have a very large click-through history with all the metadata for each item with the timestamps. And then you can replay in MetaRank. So you can uh, configure different types of feature extractors like click-through rate. And then you just replay all this history of events with your new features and you get your back-tested uh, results with all the features recomputed, even if you change something. So, uh, but uh, we see a way of integration between MetaRank and uh, VV8 for recommendations, because how we do recommendations right now is that they are collaborative filtering based ones. And in the case, if your uh, embedding is huge, uh, we're just storing everything in RAM in, you know, this HNSV lib, nothing fancy. And if you have a lot of uh, items, uh, you can't really store this in RAM because it quickly becomes expensive. Uh, so we have a way to integrate with different uh, vector search engines by offloading this embedding. So how it looks like, so you're not computing this embeddings on the side. So customer just sends analytical events. Okay, that's a user, that's a click, that's a ranking. Uh, MetaRank periodically computes all these embeddings and dumps them to VV8, for example. And then if you ask for a recommendation, it just also like a proxy for the VV8, but also computing the, the embeddings by itself. It can mm. do clip embeddings for movies, but it can do collaborative filtering embeddings for uh, interactions. It can do content embeddings for text. So two weeks ago, I took part in a hackathon to build this type of functionality. So it's not yet, so it's in the master, so, but not, there's no stable release for that. But, uh, you can do any types of embedding. So we can do sentence transformers now and something custom if you just upload a CSV there with embeddings. And then it will just serve them either from memory if it can fit memory or from some, some pluggable vector search uh, engines uh, if it can't. Yeah, also kind of in terms of uh, kind of collaboration with the other companies, uh, we did um, can we try to collaborate with open search, uh, because, uh, they've recently released the ability for external re-rankers to be plugged into open search itself. Um, but it's, it's still kind of, uh, it's only integrating only one part of, of Metrank, uh, only the retrieval part, the re-ranking part, but we still need to send the analytical events anyway. So kind of we don't see yet a, a big benefit of uh, having some sort of like a plugin that will do everything for you, because kind of because of the way Metrink is built, kind of this kind of two there are two ways you need to you to uh, to integrate with Metrink, like the retrieval and the, the analytical stuff. Um, it's hard to build a, a connector for for the for external libraries uh, kind of to integrate both of these parts. Um, it's kind of we've uh, kind of, we haven't in, investi invested yet into building a uh, a plugin for open search, um, so that's why kind of we're we're trying to concentrate on the uh, on like how you can utilize different tools together uh, like a separate uh, applications. And kind of this hackathon that Roman mentioned, and uh, kind of the the stuff around embeddings that's it built into Metrank. It's not public yet. Kind of we haven't released it yet, and there is no documentation yet. Uh, but it, it's coming hopefully soon. There is documentation. If you go on our docs, there is a, like a drop down there, and you need to choose <laughs> like not not the stable one. Yeah, the, the uh, unstable docs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but usually no one goes there. <laughs> it's 
good that you have the two separate <laughs> talks. Yeah, because <laughs> what, what we've noticed as well is that sometimes people uh, kind of look uh, in the old docs, like they're using the old version of Metrank. Uh, they're using the old version of Metrank and they're using the new docs. And that was the original problem of having like separate branches for the docs as well. I guess on the topic of collaborative filtering and also like click through rate and personalized recommendation, um, I guess how does this solve the like cold start problem? Like I'm new to a website, but um, maybe there's some metadata on my interactions on Google. Um, how do, how do you guys handle that? I guess if my question was clear enough. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it depends on what you count as a information about you. So when you just land it on the website, we can already know are you on mobile or on desktop from which uh, refer you came. Not like exactly refer, but probably mm -hmm. it's a, like organic Google search advertisement or maybe Instagram link on this type of granularity. Uh, your location, maybe time of date, uh, time, date, and so on. That's still content context. And even with this amount of information, oh, and the page you landed to. So if it's just the top page, that's one thing. If you landed on a specific product, probably, and you came from Google, probably mm -hmm. you searched for this product on Google and clicked on a link. So that's also an interesting bit of a con context about you. So even without interactions, uh, any website can know quite a lot about you, but not like, you know, privacy sensitive information, but more like an aggregation. So, okay, you came here. We have no idea who you are. We don't know the name, your click history, nothing, but just some hints that you came from mobile, from US in the middle of a Sunday night, uh, from a Google and came on a specific product. That's enough to adapt, at least to see how other uh, people like you interacted in the past and adapt. Yeah, and uh, yeah. yeah, maybe also to add on top of that, um, in the company kind of we've previously worked in, we, we did quite a few A-B tests that showed that uh, kind of this approach really increases the conversion eventually because mm. Kind of, yeah, of course, kind of you're a unique person, uh, but when you aggregate you among like 100,000 of other people, you have similar behaviors and uh, the ability of, uh, of the personalization model to adapt quickly uh, to what you do on the website. Uh, yeah, kind of you, as Roman mentioned, kind of we already know where you came from and kind of what's, what's your location. But as, as long as you click a few items, we already know kind of your interests, uh, Kind of what type of products you 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 want to buy or whatever it's gonna kind of, all of that can is directly ingested into the model and uh, in almost real time you get a personalized ranking afterwards so you don't need to know like really a lot about a person uh, to start personalizing as long as you have like the model built as long as you use metrank for example <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess I always forget how much information is just um, like how you can create like this digital profile so easily. It's just like, boom, I'm on the website and now I've been, I'm not as unique as you said, right? Like <laughs> I'm as similar as someone else's behavior and, you know, it is personalized and the products that you recommend are accurate. It's amazing. There is some sort of a balance between privacy intrusiveness um, mm -hmm. and uh, like business values. So MetaRank tries to be as generic as possible. So <clears throat> for example, a uh, long time ago, we not, not, it's not related to MetaRank, but uh, I've seen people doing it that uh, you can integrate with the DMP type of provider providers to get some more granular information about what you did before on other websites. So uh, advertisements, as uh, advertisers usually not only know this information about you, like, you know, Facebook, uh, they know your interests and uh, you can purchase this type of segments, for, for like to which segments you belong. And so, but uh, it's usually used for ads and uh, 
there is some a couple of large DMP platforms uh, from like from Oracle and uh, so on, and they uh, <laughs> on Oracle. Now there was uh, uh, a link somewhere that you can go with your normal browser. Uh, to unsubscribe, like just opt out of tracking. And there you can ask uh, for the data you have. For some reason, this link is uh, down for a year. I'm just trying to do it again and again, and it's still kind of temporary problems come again later. And that's, um, but when it worked, it uh, shown you like a segments uh, uh, for like it's a type of third party tracking. And that's very privacy intrusive for me. So I'm against using it. And MetaRank is about first, uh, for like a first party type of tracking. So you have zero known about you when you came on the, on the website. So, okay, you're on a mobile from UK. That's kind of it but it's not that privacy intrusive as knowing your gender based on your searches on Facebook. Yeah, I'm really curious. That, well, this kind of brings me into this topic of like the rank lens demo that you have and sort of this general topic of recommendation data sets. I think um, like, what do you think about sort of the user features that are captured in these data sets? Are they realistic compared to the applications you work on? I think uh, probably like a small remark is that uh, all the data sets uh, that exist really suck because uh, usually they have, let's say, like information about the items, maybe some information about the searches and zero information about the, the actual users that did the search. So it's almost impossible to do uh, like a ranking demo uh, because there are no open data sets that have user behavior uh, embedded in them. And can that, that was the background why we had to come up with our own data sets, kind of spend our money, et cetera, um, use crowdsourcing uh, engine, uh, Toloka AI uh, to, to help us build the, the, the necessary interactions uh, for, the, for the data set as well. Roman, what do you think? Yeah, so for search, it's still problematic. There are some data sets, but they are usually very text focused or maybe in a very specific domain, like uh, question answering in a medical search, which is nice, but not e-commerce usually where the money are. Um, uh, Last year, there was this Amazon EECI -E dataset released, which I'm really a big fan of. The problem of this dataset is that there is not so, it's also text, too, te too, too focused on text. You have like a search query, product title, product description. That's it. Uh, and uh, you can't do much on this data set with MetaRank, even if it's wonderful on its coverage. It's uh, 150,000 queries re referencing almost 1.6 million products. So, and all this, uh, and explicit labels for all of them, which is very, uh, very expensive to build. And it's, uh, I'm glad Amazon open source this type of labels. But you don't have metadata. You don't have anything about users. Uh, we can't do anything about users because it's Amazon. Uh, but we can do about uh, metadata because uh, the product ID and the ACI dataset is Amazon uh, product ID. This ASIN. So you can scrape. <laughs> uh, kind of scraping 2 million Amazon products is a tricky process. But we actually did it. We won't say uh, that we've done it. We won't say yeah. that we've done it. Uh, so, so, some someone else did it. And <laughs> so for, formally, formally, uh, that's a good question from the legality. So uh, um, there was a, a court case, uh, LinkedIn versus someone I forgot the name, IQ something, who scraped LinkedIn, and even they scraped like a private data on LinkedIn, your contact data on LinkedIn, and still they won that it's kind of a still not really private data, it's still open. So 
uh, we didn't scrape any private data. We didn't uh, use any tricks to uh, sneak into the logged in section of the website. It's just what Google sees. Like Google can scrape Amazon. Why can't we scrape Amazon? Like the same in the same way of Google. So there is an extension for the CSCI data set from, from me personally to uh, with all this metadata like prices, uh, product popularity, review score, number of reviews, and all this structured information about and categories, which is also very important. So the end goal is to have some sort of a search demo of meta ranks, but there was no data set and then Amazon ESCI came, but there is something missing and now it's, now it's better. Yeah, but still it kind of misses the, the user metadata. So it's kind of hard to do personalized ranking demos or uh, like tests even. Um, and that's maybe like if, uh, Amazon will collaborate with uh, Mechanical Turk, for example, which is an Amazon service. Uh, they can produce a data set that is kind of labeled with users as well, with user information. Um, kind of, as, as I mentioned earlier, that's why kind of we had to build our own data sets and kind of we've uh, made it open source as well for everyone to use. Uh, but it's kind of, it's hard for us to, to make it popular uh, among, among people because we're a small, kind of a small company. Uh, um, not, and not and even... still it's not that big. Uh, of a data set as well. And, not, uh, not, it's kind of focused on the movies, so not e-commerce. So. I don't call it a company, just two folks doing open source yeah. technically. So company assumes yeah. that you make money on that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is such an interesting topic. Um, when we were prototyping Reftivec, I had you know gone to Twitter and sort of similarly use the Twitter API to kind of like reverse out their recommendation a little bit. Like you can get some tweets out that way and then you can see how well averaging the embeddings of like tweets, like for the case of our Reftivec thing. Uh, so this last question I have for you is a pretty big one. I'm very curious what your opinion is on these cross encoder models that are like take the query and document as input to a high capacity transformer. And uh, particularly, there's kind of, well, maybe actually, let me just set it up just generally. Like, what do you think about these kind of cross encoders compared to the XGBoost style models that we've mostly been talking about? And these cross encoders are not against XGBoost. It's just a supplementary thing, like orthogonal. So um, mm. it's not only about cross encoders uh, as is. There are some other retrieval models like Colbert and all this uh, modern mm -hmm. stuff with Splayed. And uh, it's just extra information for the final mm -hmm. ranking. So you just combine different signals from different types of uh, ranking algorithms uh, together, mm -hmm. trying to push your ranking quality further. So um, I think cross encoders are wonderful, uh, but uh, I got an impression that people uh, consider cross encoders like some rocket science. Oh, to train a cross encoder, to fine tune cross encoder, you need to have a team of data scientists to do, uh, which is surprisingly not the case. Uh, so it's quite easy, just you only need to have a GPU, a beefy GPU, but that's the only thing you need. And, uh, but for example, for, for the sentence transformers uh, package, everything is implemented for you and it's very nicely documented and different approaches with different pros and cons and even examples on how to fine tune on MS Marco, for example, just plug your own data set and, uh, leave it for, for a night. Hmm. Yeah, so that's what I'm actually doing right now. You mentioned that Erica, you was uh, you were accepted on the haystack. Uh, me too. So we'll we'll oh, see nice. each other there. So nice. I'm trying. Uh, so that I'm going to speak about this particular type of uh, particular problem of combining learned rank and uh, 
term search, metadata, and vector search. So it's usually not about choosing something like, okay, we need to use only vector search instead of Elastic. No, you shouldn't. Mm. You really just throw everything together in a giant ensemble model, and it usually works better than single separate one. Hmm. And also, congratulations on getting accepted. I'm looking forward to your talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I need to prepare it. That's the complete, the most complicated yeah. part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. I think. Um, yeah. Well, I, I love that perspective on cross encoders as just another signal. I I think it makes a ton of sense. I, I guess kind of. One more little thing I want to add to this is kind of the idea of the large language model ranking and whether you can, you know, like distill that into another feature or use that to train the cross encoder or, the, or this kind of thing. But like the idea where I might have like, you know, let's say it's Connor watching movies and I have a description of Connor, like I kind of translate these tabular features into text. And then I use like query tabular to text translation and the current movie description like you know, all of that goes as input to the <laughs> GPT-4 fireplace to like get the ranking. What do you think about that? Kind of like what role do large language models have in ranking? Uh, I think the larger the model, the more context it might handle, not only about your query and your products, but just some common sense understanding about things. So in this hackathon, we did a couple of uh, examples of semantic uh, recommendations for movies. It was just movie lens data set with the uh, different algorithms of recommendations like collaborative filtering, semantic embeddings with mini LM, like tiny model compared to chat GPT, it's just like, you know, minuscule. And uh, it was embeddings from Cohere AI, which are quite huge as far as i know it's 100 something billions of uh, links and uh, the embedding itself is 2000 something the dimensionality is like 2048 so that's a huge one and if you start clicking on movies and see what was going to be recommended to you you notice that sometimes the small embedding and large embedding are generating almost the same thing uh, in some simple cases. So I don't know, you go for a Terminator movie, you might guess what you will get on all the algorithms because it's quite an easy task. You don't need a lot of context. You need to know what robot is and like robot killing people, that's it. Uh, but a wonderful example was about aliens there, aliens movie. Uh, so, collaborative filtering suggested something other people like. Yeah, it was something about space and some some creepy movies. Uh, and this large uh, embeddings from Cohere AI also was about different types of aliens, which are usually not very kind to people. So. Um, a bit different types of movies than collaborative filtering, but still in the same area. And uh, the small embedding, which has a very limited amount of memory and the amount of context it can handle, it, fo it found a couple of alien movies from the same franchise. Then it decided, okay, that's actually people escaping from something. Why don't you put movies about escaping from a jail? The same thing. And yeah, there's a movie called uh, A Man Called Ripley. Ripley is so unusual name. Probably that's the same Ripley. Uh, so semantically, good match. But uh, with the 80 megabytes, 80 millions of uh, connections in the network, you can't just learn that there can be multiple Ripleys, actually. And uh, you can... There are multiple types of jails, and some jails are flying in space, and there's a bit different thing than jail on Earth. Uh, so I think the larger the model, the more descriptive it is, but it usually depends on hardware. So Cohere AI is like $1 per 1,000 uh, embeddings, 
And if you need to embed 1 million items, like ESCI dataset, you need to, to, you need to spend $2,000 on that. So quite expensive for, for a hackathon type of project, quite expensive. And you need to do it periodically because your items are changing in time. So it's about resources. Yeah, amazing. Well, I thought this was a great podcast. Roman, Siva, thank you so much for your time. Erica, for joining the podcast for the first time. And um, yeah, it's such a great d dive into these topics around ranking. I think it can kind of, the cross encoder can seem so simple, just this kind of like query document and this distinction where retrieval is like this kind of coarse grain search with the vector index or inverted index with the VM25, things like this. And then we have this more fine grained high capacity model and and kind of transitioning into the XG boost with the metadata features and all the things you're doing behind it. I think it's so interesting, like as we talked about the streaming data to estimate the click through rate. And, and yeah, just the whole thing is so interesting. So thank you all so much for joining the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.